Norwich is a fine city. Professor Alice Roberts claimed that it was Britain's most Tudor city, but all the centuries have left their mark. Norwich benefits from some amazing buildings from the past, but we also need to consider how our own building programme will impact on the city and be judged by future generations. The Norwich Society was set up in 1923 in response to a threat to Bishopbridge, and it has since campaigned to preserve the best of the old whilst also encouraging good new architecture. Today, I am going to look at how past centuries have contributed to Norwich's architectural history and how the 21st century is shaping up. If you stand outside City Hall, by turning 360 degrees, you can see nearly 1,000 years of building history, from the castle begun by the Normans in the 1090s to the market relocated by the Normans from Tombland, the Guild Hall built in the early 15th century on an even older undercroft, St Peter Mancroft from the mid-15th century, jumping to City Hall in the 1930s, and then the Forum brings us into the 21st century. We're going to look in a little more detail at some of the significant buildings over the centuries, starting with the medieval period. Norwich is characterised by the large numbers of medieval churches. By 1450, there were almost 60. Only a small proportion are still used for worship, while many have been deconsecrated and used for other purposes. The Norwich Society's own offices are now in St Martin at Palace, also the headquarters of the Norwich Historic Churches Trust, which manages 18 churches. In medieval and Tudor times, Norwich was one of the wealthiest cities in England, mainly due to the wool and textiles trade. Merchants built themselves grand houses, which also operated as trading places. Strangers Hall on Charing's Cross is one of Norwich's oldest buildings, dating to 1320, formerly the home of Sir Nicholas Southerton, Mayor of Norwich, who gave refuge to the strangers, who were cloth weavers from Holland and Belgium in the 16th century. Dragon Hall in King Street is a unique survival of an early 15th century merchant trading hall, now enjoying a new identity as the National Centre for Writing. The leaning half-timpered house was built for Augustine Steward, three times Mayor of Norwich between 1540 and 1556. The Earl of Warwick used this house as one of his headquarters during Kett's Rebellion in 1549. Elm Hill is the most complete Tudor street in the city. A major fire destroyed most buildings in 1507, but the properties were rebuilt. During the medieval period, it was the epicentre of society, with 16 mayors and sheriffs living there. In the 1920s and 30s, Elm Hill was under threat from demolition and redevelopment. The Norwich Society ran a successful campaign to save Elm Hill as one of the architectural gems of the city. John and Margaret Paston had a house on Elm Hill where some of the Paston letters were probably written. However, this house was one destroyed in 1507 and the present house on the site, now occupied by the Strangers Club, was built after the fire by Sheriff of Norwich and three times Mayor Augustine Steward. The Music House in King Street is thought to be the oldest surviving house in Norwich started in the early 12th century. Sir John Paston bought the building and remodelled it in 1488. It's got its name during the Elizabethan period, when the city's official band of musicians practised here. The Norwich Waits were a famous band of five musicians who all lived in King Street and were presented with their instruments by Queen Elizabeth I, who visited Norwich in 1578. In the 18th century, the building was purchased by Young, Crochet and Youngs, one of the city's big four breweries, as it was adjacent to their Crown Brewery and they used it as a pub for the next 150 years. There is still a public bar in the basement. In the medieval and Tudor periods, we know the names of the commissioners and owners of these major buildings, but not necessarily the architects. In the 18th century, we start getting named architects, some of whom influence building styles internationally. 
Thomas Ivory was the preeminent architect in Georgian Norwich. He started work as a builder and joiner, but soon extended his business. He won important public commissions, but also responded to the desire of merchants, made wealthy by the booming textiles industry, to build grand homes. In 1751, he was appointed as carpenter, a grander job than it sounds, at Norwich's Great Hospital, where he was responsible for building maintenance, a position he retained throughout his life. He built a grand house for himself in 1756, St. Helen's House, adjacent to the Great Hospital. He began work on the Octagon Chapel in 1754 and the building was opened in 1756. Ivory's design proved so popular that it was used as a model for subsequent Methodist meeting houses across Europe. The Assembly House was reconstructed from existing buildings in 1755 by Thomas Ivory and became a focal point for cultural events in the Regency period. Madame Tussaud exhibited waxworks here and composer Franz Liszt gave a concert recital. Other elegant examples of Ivory's work can be seen at Ivory House All Saints Green, which was built in 1771, nearby St Catherine's House All Saints Green, and 29 to 35 Surrey Street. Ivory built the new Theatre Royal in 1758, based on the Drury Lane Theatre in London. Ivory operated the theatre himself and is recorded as having obtained a licence for his company of actors, the Norwich Company of Comedians, to perform in Norwich in 1768. Michael Blackwell goes into more detail about the history of Norwich's theatres in the 18th century in his video talk for the Norwich Society Historians, viewable on the Norwich Society's YouTube channel. Thomas Ivory also built the original Norfolk and Norwich Hospital in 1771. It was great, later to be greatly enlarged by another famous Norwich architect, Edward Boardman. Who we now move on to. Local architect Edward Boardman had a great impact on Victorian Norwich, meeting the needs of the new industrialists. The Boardman practice continued under his son, E.T. Boardman, until 1966. From 1868, Boardman lived and worked in premises off Queen Street, next to what briefly had been a branch of the Bank of England. By 1875, with a growing business and large family, he moved his home to the Newmarket Road. The office was altered and given a Gothic frontage. Following the collapse of the textile trade in Norwich, new industries such as shoemaking, banking and insurance took over, and these needed functional and impressive buildings to suit their purposes. The Howlett and White Limited shoe factory in St George's was designed by Edward Boardman in 1876. The original building was extended in 1894. Part of it now houses the Jane Austen College. Edward Boardman won the contract to enlarge Thomas Ivory's 18th century hospital and the new facilities opened in 1881. When the hospital moved to the outskirts of the city, the city centre hospital was converted into apartments. In the 19th century, hotel accommodation became more luxurious as business and tourism travel increased. The Royal Hotel replaced an earlier Royal Hotel on Gentleman's Walk. It boasted luxurious decorations and all modern conveniences. Each floor was supplied with two sets of closets and bathrooms, one for gentlemen and the other for ladies. It closed as a hotel in the 1970s, but I believe there are plans to reintroduce hotel accommodation on the upper floors. Norwich is proud to be the home of the best-selling regional newspaper in England. The EDP was founded in 1870 and shortly afterwards acquired Pig's Warehouse, a large site on the north side of London Street, which enabled the newspaper to bring the publishing and printing sites under one roof. The printing workshops have now largely disappeared, but the London Street elevation, which was designed in 1899 by Edward Boardman, is still intact. You can read all about these buildings and many others in the Norwich Society's book on Boardman, which is available from Gerald's or the City Bookshop. 
George Skipper overlapped with Boardman and took over the baton in developing the face of Victorian and Edwardian Norwich by creating lavish premises for the new types of business. His work is characterised by an exuberant style. He built these offices for himself in 1896, now part of Gerald's. He designed the Royal Arcade in 1899, which is built on the coaching yard of the old Royal Hotel. It retains the old Royal's frontage on Gentleman's Walk. Gerald's already occupied the premises in London and Exchange Streets when Skipper was asked to remodel the building. It is characterised by Skipper's inventive use of traditional architectural styles. This panel on the facade on London Street features Skipper with his family and a client. In the background are three of his buildings, Norfolk Daily Standard Offices, Surrey House and Commercial Chambers. Banking and insurance became big industries in the 19th century. Surrey Street was the site of the Duke of Surrey's mansion in the 16th century, hence the street name. The mansion was demolished and George Skipper was commissioned to build a new headquarters for Norwich Union, beginning in 1900. The interior is a sumptuous homage to the English Renaissance. The marble hall is fashioned from 15 kinds of marble which were destined for Westminster Cathedral. The cost proved too much for the cathedral authorities, but Skipper persuaded Norwich Union to buy the entire consignment and he used it to stunning effect. The high status and importance of banking and insurance can be seen in the lavish Baroque style of the Norwich and London Accident Insurance Association and the London Provincial Bank. You can read all about Skipper's work in this recently published lavish book by Richard Barnes. In the 20th century, historical architectural styles were replaced with new ideas and improvements in social housing made a significant impact on our city. Norwich hit national headlines in August 1912 when torrential rain fell for 20 hours and seven and a half inches of rain were recorded. Streets flooded and over three and a half thousand houses were affected, especially in the north of the city. Three people were killed and 2,200 people were evacuated. This drew attention to the appalling living conditions of many people housed in insanitary courts and yards. It was agreed that the council would purchase the properties and this started a big programme of slum clearance and council house building. The Mile Cross Estate marked a step change in the provision of social housing. Building started in 1919. By 1932, 1,400 houses had been built on the estate, comprising 40% of the city's total council homes, with its own schools, shops and other facilities. The Norwich Society's publication charts the development of social housing from the Great Hospital to award-winning award -winning Goldsmith Street and includes the great programme of council house building stimulated by the Great Flood. Until the 1930s, the City Council was housed in the Guildhall, built in the early 15th century. By the 20th century, it was becoming very cramped and a new seat of local government was needed. Norwich City Hall is an impressive Art Deco building designed by Charles Holloway James and Stephen Rowland Pierce and boasts the longest balcony in England at 111 metres. It was completed in 1938 and officially opened by King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. The whole complex should have been a complete quadrangle, so the rear of the building looks and is unfinished. The sculptures of recreation, wisdom and education by Alfred Hardiman, seen distantly in the car park, would have been more visible if the project had been completed. The University of East Anglia was established in 1963 and is characterised by its many significant contemporary buildings. The famous ziggurats were designed by Dennis Lasden and opened a student accommodation in 1966. 
One of the most prestigious buildings on campus is the Sainsbury Centre for Visual Arts, designed by Norman Foster in the mid-1970s. Its uncompromising modern style means that it is in demand as a futuristic film set. Some credits include acting as the new headquarters of the Avengers in Avengers Age of Ultron, 2015. It also starred in Spider-Man Homecoming in 2017. In 1945, communities were being rebuilt and Norwich City Council published its 50-year vision for Norwich, giving a blueprint for a future fine city. Perhaps the most significant feature of the plan was a viaduct across the river at Brackendale to complete the inner ring road. The goal was to help drivers avoid queues at Carrow Bridge, which remains a traffic hotspot. The planners were hopeful the major project would be popular with people in the city. I quote, the viaduct, apart from its utility, could be a light and elegant structure of great beauty and would command a wonderful view of the old city from which it would be seen as a terminating feature and a break between it and the commercial and industrial zone farther down the river valley. Due to local opposition, this flyover was never built, but the next one was. Anglia Square was extensively redeveloped during the 1960s and 70s, following the construction of St Crispin's Road. It is a key part of a vibrant shopping street, but has now become very tired and dated. Plans to redevelop it are still being considered. When the Magdalen Street flyover opened on the June 12, 1972, cars queued up to drive on the new Inner Link Road, which was hailed as a traffic planner's dream. At the time, the Magdalen Street Traders Association fought hard to keep the flyover from being built, setting up a petition which, which received 2,000 signatures and even as late as May 1970 was calling for the council to rethink the plans, which it referred to as a grave error. So what does the 21st century hold for us? In 1935, an art master at City of Norwich School, Walter Watling, drew Norwich in AD 2035. It represents his prophetic dream in which he was introduced to somebody over the televisophone, who I quote, promised to send along the glasses and in another minute they arrived by the pneumatic tube delivery service. So do the most recent buildings in Norwich match up to Mr Watling's dream? The Norwich Society is keen to encourage good new design that will complement our splendid historic environment and become the heritage of, this, of the future. To this end, in 2003, the Norwich Society launched Design Awards to be held every two years to encourage and highlight the best of contemporary architecture within the city boundary. The aim of the Society was to stimulate interest, promote critical assessment and publicise the variety of buildings that make up the city scene. Many of the following projects have won awards and we hope these demonstrate how our rich heritage has continued to grow in the 21st century. So what do we look for when considering making an award? We're looking for buildings and projects that inspire and posit positively affect our shared built environment now and in the future. And we're looking for high level of design and craftsmanship in construction but also sustainable projects that support communities' health, social and cultural well-being, and also community projects that contribute to local life, promote a pride of place and benefit from community participation and engagement. Housing is essential to, in creating an active and thriving city. Norwich's centre poses the particular challenge of integrating housing schemes, especially of a larger scale, into the medieval street pattern, while maintaining a sense of place and respect for the historic fabric of the city. A particular feature of Norwich is its confluence of two rivers, the Yare and the Wensum. Here you can see two new developments whose scale and style suits the character of the river. Historically, the riverside has been industrial in nature and neglected in parts. However, there has been huge development in recent years here you can see many of the Coleman's work buildings, which have been converted into apartments. 
The Albion spinning mill was used for making worsted silk and mohair before being converted for making confectionery and then used for many years as the Reed Woodrow flour mill. After Reed's closed in 1993, the building stood empty for a decade until it was finally sold in 2005 and subsequently redeveloped into Riverside Apartments. These conversions have been joined by new developments. Riverside Heights is a cluster of six blocks on Geoffrey Watling Way, two of them linked by an atrium. It has environmentally friendly brown roofs, providing a natural habitat for flora and fauna. The development has enabled the creation of a wide, well-planned riverside path. Climate change is high on the agenda and has led to fabric first, low energy house design. Passive House is an example of this, where design and detailing reduce the heat loss to such an extent that conventional heating systems are no longer required. Norwich is at the forefront nationally of these developments, thanks to the innovative approach of the City Council, which set up Norwich Regeneration Limited to support the construction of new build homes as part of its ambition to make a low carbon city. The aim is to build 1,000 low energy houses over the next 10 years. Goldsmith Street provides 105 social homes for the City Council to passive house standards and won the 2019 Stirling Prize. It is a simple series of seven terrace blocks arranged in four lines. The clever use of asymmetric roof profiles allows sunlight and good levels of daylight into all the streets. The Enterprise Centre has been declared the most sustainable building in Europe and is built from natural materials, primarily straw treated to last for 100 years within frames using red cedar from Thetford Forest. It meets the passive house insulation standard and has excellent natural ventilation, meaning that it uses minimal energy for space heating and cooling. The building won a National Reber Award and a Civic Voice National Award. City College Norwich is one of the largest colleges of further and higher education in the country, with over 11,000 students. It moved to its current site on Ips Ipswich Road in 1953 and has undergone substantial redevelopment in recent years. This includes the Creative Arts Building opened in 2013. The design was inspired by traditional Norfolk barns and Norfolk churches. It contains many sustainable and low energy elements and won a Civic Trust Award for demonstrating high quality design and sustainability. Refurbishment and extension of the M&S store combines a checkerboard clad facade with a living wall of plants that absorb pollution and uses water from a rain harvesting system on the roof of the store. Government funding for academies has supported the construction of two new build high schools in Norwich. The Open Academy was conceived as a series of concentric rings that form the main drum of the building. The inner band provides the main circulation, while the outer band contains classrooms to maximise natural daylight, ventilation and views. A cross laminated timber system forms the structural core, halving the building's carbon footprint. The City Academy, next to the UEA, aimed to create a state-of-the-art learning environment, forming a bridge between two local communities it serves and the university whose facilities it shares. The design solution was a flowing curve between east and north. Student housing has a big effect upon the city skyline and there has been a huge growth in student numbers. There are two universities the University of East Anglia and Norwich University, University of the Arts. Together with Norwich City College, these bodies have over 30,000 students. There has been considerable building of new accommodation for the UEA on the campus itself. A recent example is Barton and Hickling House. These student residences are clad with pale grey panels to complement the concrete structures of the original campus. But it is, it is perhaps the new housing in the city centre that has the most impact. Winnell's Yard provides accommodation for newer students and rises up to eight storeys on its prominent site on Queen's Road adjacent to the bus station. The main facades are in a striking brick, which has proved controversial, but it's now becoming more accepted. 
Pablo Fanke House is one of the highest buildings in the city. This bold design is a combination of five blocks which break up their visual bulk by stepping up in height from eight storeys in the south to 14 in the north. However, whatever the pros and cons of the design, situated as it is in Surrey Street, it contributes to the increasing canyonization of the city centre. Civic amenities don't have to be dull. The bus station replaced an older building and makes a striking statement with its steel canopy. It was winner of the Civic Building of the Year in 2006, awarded by the Society for Construction and Architecture and local authorities. Another award winner is the Rose Lane Car Park, which features lightweight perforated cladding rather than the more usual grey concrete. Norwich regularly features in the top 10 shopping venues in the UK. There has been extensive retail investment in the city centre in recent years, which it is hoped will be maintained despite the pressures of online shopping and more recently COVID-19. Chantry Place is located on the Brownfield site of the former Roundtree Macintosh Chocolate Factory. It includes over 100 retail and catering units, as well as 118 apartments, landscape areas and parking for a thousand cars. Castle Quarter Centre was opened in September 1993. Rather than building upwards, the project involved excavating a major site next to the castle, which resulted in the biggest archaeological dig in Europe. It consists of several floors of retail and catering units with extensive parking in the basement. More recently, it has reinvented itself as more of a leisure destination and the entrance received a facelift in 2015. A more modest retail design was adopted for the facade of the White Company on Gentleman's Walk. It was a bold decision to go for an uncompromisingly modern design, albeit in scale with its, its historic neighbours rather than a, an historic pastiche. One of the most striking vistas in Norwich, the Gerald Bridge, literally bridges the old and the new, providing a link between contemporary Riverside offices and the cathedral. In 2015, the Writers' Centre Norwich took over the lease of Dragon Hall and added a new South Wing. Following the designation of Norwich as a UNESCO City of Literature in 2012, the centre became the National Centre for Writing. The new extension gives a contemporary appearance to the complex while remaining complementary to the main hall. Norwich University of the Arts was founded as Norwich School of Design in 1845 and gained full university status in 2013. In contrast to the UEA, it is based in the city centre around the old art school and is, it has expanded through acquisition and conversion of existing buildings, much of it carried out by Hudson architects, who have managed to combine the old and the new in a striking way. We have already seen some of the work of Edward Boardman, his name lives on in Boardman House on Elm Hill, the old church rooms he designed along with the Congregational Chapel in 1879. In 2015, this building was imaginative, imaginatively refurbished by Norwich University of the Arts to house its School of Architecture. This refurbishment won the Norwich Society's Conservation Design Award in 2017. Norwich is one of the few cities in the UK that have both Anglican and Roman Catholic cathedrals. They have undertaken major developments since the turn of the century to enhance their public facilities and improve accessibility. The Anglican Cathedral has commissioned two new projects from Hopkins Architects, the Refectory and the Hostry. The Refectory combines the existing medieval walls with striking timber structures. The hostry, which means a monastic reception place, is of similar design and provides a welcoming space for visitors to the cathedral. The narthex, or antechamber, is a new visitor centre and multi-use community building at the Roman Catholic Cathedral. It was, as far as possible, constructed using local materials. It won awards from the Norfolk Association of Architects and the Norwich Society. Quayside occupies one of the most historic of Norwich's riverside sites and is a clever combination of old and new. 
The building on the extreme left is an old school, and the light blue building in the centre, together with its left-hand neighbour, were old quayside warehouses. The modern buildings in between are designed in a sympathetic style, providing an attractive frontage on a scale which fits in well with the surroundings. The Forum is the building which has probably had the greatest impact on the city this century. Benefiting from capital funding by the Millennium Commission, the Forum was designed by the award-winning architect Sir Michael Hopkins to replace the old Norwich Central Library, which burnt down in 1994. The building is conceived as a courtyard surrounded by a three-storey horseshoe-shaped enclosure which accommodates various activities including libraries, the BBC studios and restaurants. Its spectacular glazed end wall frames and reflects the Gothic church tower of St Peter Mancroft. The building won a Civic Trust Award for Urban Design and the Reba Regional Award. The Norwich Society has produced a booklet which looks at 21st century architecture in Norwich, available from Gerald's and the City Bookshop. In 2019, we started a collaboration with the Norfolk Association of Architects and Civic Voice, who each had their own design awards, to create the Design and Craftsmanship Awards. We are in the process of judging the 2021 awards, and here you can see some of the projects that have been submitted. The awards will be announced next month. It is encouraging to see that a number of existing buildings have benefited from refurbishment. Although fairly recently built, Norwich bus station has needed quite substantial refurbishment in its public areas. This pub is local to me, so I'm particularly pleased to see this refurbishment that includes an excellent restaurant. It's good to see historic buildings conserved and brought into modern use. Weaving Norwich stuffs and then Norwich shawls was once the major industry in the city. A few buildings survive where weavers lived and worked, and it's good to see them preserved. Elm Hill is one of the most attractive historic streets in Norwich, but its Tudor buildings often require attention. The Norwich Preservation Trust was formed in 1966 as a joint venture between Norwich City Council and the Norwich Society to preserve and restore historic buildings in the city. The Trust acts as a restorer of last resort and often takes on commercially non-viable projects and has become an exemplar for similar bodies in the rest of Britain. Since 1966, the Trust has saved or restored buildings like Augustine Stewart House in Tombland and unveiled hidden gems like the 16th century Merchant's House in Firebridge Street. The latest project to be completed is 16 Elm Hill. Student accommodation accounts for some of the largest new build projects in Norwich. Benedict's Gate has 300 student bedrooms and has been built over an existing city council car park. The west elevation forms a backdrop to the medieval city walls. The Nest is one of the ways in which Norwich City Football Club makes a contribution to the wider community, encouraging participation and providing facilities that can be used by all. Housing has won many awards in the past. This one may seem rather modest, but has aligned itself with the neighbouring houses in a harmonious way, while also showing clean modern design. A more cutting edge contemporary style can be seen in this private house. Our partner in these awards, Civic Voice, places particular emphasis on community projects as you can see, this is not a building, but a development of a significant community space that has in the past been a focus for various illegal activities. A local group has adopted it in order to make a more attractive and safer place for people to enjoy. During lockdown, I personally made extensive use of the community book cupboard. That concludes my talk, and I'd like to end by saying something about the Norwich Society. What does the Norwich Society actually do? 
this can be best summed up as helping people to enjoy the history and character of Norwich and shape its future. And how do we do that? Well, monitoring planning applications, encouraging good design in new buildings, keeping an eye on streets and other open spaces, protecting heritage buildings, looking to the long-term future of the city and encouraging people to explore the city. We're a passionate supporter of Norwich and it would be great if you could keep in touch with us through these various means. We have a, a lovely website. We're also on Twitter. We have a Facebook page. The Norwich Society historians have their own Facebook page. And we now also have our YouTube channel where many of our historians talks are available.